الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يعده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا وحبيبنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الدين عند الله الاسلام ومن يبتغ غير الاسلام دينا فلن يقبل منه وهو في الآخرة من الخاسرين صدق الله وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك لمن الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين our respected brothers and sisters first of all I would like to thank all of you and especially my respected brother Maulana Hafiz Faiz Ali Shah Sahab you people have arranged and provided me such an ample opportunity in which for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I will talk for a few minutes and i will try to the best of my knowledge to confine my talk to the saying of allah and rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is this is the first ever lecture in this regard as hafiz sahab said we will try to our best to continue this program every month so as this is the first one therefore i recited an aya of holy quran related and talked about our deen and that is islam so today i will talk about the fundamentals of our deen the basics of our deen as you know that in deen two terms are very well known one islam and the second one is iman islam and iman sometime has been used by allah and rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam synonymous in one meaning allah said islam and he meant iman sometime he used the word iman and he meant islam while some other time islam is one thing and iman is another one in this regard i would like to quote a saying of hafiz ibn rajab al hanbali rahimahullah who was the first ever sharih of the very well known book of imam bukhari rahimahullah he has said al iman wal islam is a ijtama wa tafarraqa wa iza tafarraqa ijtama whenever you will use both the words in the same context so islam will mean something else while iman will mean something else and whenever you use separately the word islam and iman so you can mean by islam iman and by iman islam So first of all I would like to take you back to dictionary Islam and iman where from these three word the two words have come in Arabic language two words salam and aman 
both are used in the meaning of peace now when you will take the salam and aman to bab e fal and you use the word islam and iman then dictionary meaning or literally meaning of islam and iman is the same and that is to avail peace and to provide peace amantuhu i have provided him peace aslamtuhu i have provided him peace aslam to li nafsi i avail peace for myself amal to li nafsi i avail and achieved peace for myself so that is its dictionary meaning while technically islam means surrender to allah subhanahu wa taala obedience of allah subhanahu wa taala submission to allah subhanahu wa taala and as a name of our deen and not only of ours but as a name of the deen given by allah subhanahu wa taala to all the messengers as hafiz sahab mentioned a name of our great scholar of subcontinent who is the i will like i would like to say that he was the exchange of ulama for quran and sunnah subcontinent and not only in subcontinent for two years he remained there in saudi arabia of his own time and he taught their holy quran and sunnah his name is shah waliullah muhaddis dalawi rahimahullah he is the exchange of our narration chain for tafsir and hadith so shah waliullah rahimahullah he has written a book a very well known book by the name of hujjatullah al baligha in that very book he has written a chapter and the chapter says is ان الدين واحد او ان اصل الدين واحد والشرائع مختلفه the deen is one and the same since the days of hazrat adam up to the days of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam but the sharia the rules and the laws given to various messenger for their specific region for their specific people these are different musa alaihi salatu wasalam had one sharia and one type of laws while it was a little bit modified in the lifetime of hazrat isa alaihi salatu wasalam rules in the lifetime of hazrat nuh alaihi salatu wasalam was different than the rules given in the lifetime of hazrat ibrahim alaihi salatu wasalam and that what allah subhanahu wa taala mentioned when he said in surah ashura shara alakum min ad-din ma wasa bihi nuh wal ladhi awhayna ilayka allah subhanahu wa taala says that we have enjoined and we have given you the same deen which we had given to nuh to ibrahim to musa and to isa and the philosophy are the very objective of their deen was an aqimuddin to implement it to establish it what we can mean by implementation of deen we are not rulers we are not kings we have no any power to implement the deen of allah subhanahu wa taala in specific region now what we can mean by iqamat ad-din an aqim ad-din means to follow the deen given by allah subhanahu wa taala in every aspect of our life that what we can mean by iqamat ad-din as far as our individual practice is concerned and if you will address the kings and rulers of the muslim world then by iqamat ad-din we will mean to implement the deen of allah subhanahu wa taala as law of the land as law of the state concerned an aqim ad-din and whenever there will be the establishment of deen and implementation of deen there will be no any division you will never find any kind of sect there will be unity there will be wahda and wahda is required by quran and sunnah as allah subhanahu wa taala said in holy quran wa atasimu bi habl allah jamia get hold of the rope of allah subhanahu wa taala hazrat anas as Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam what Allah subhanahu wa taala meant by the rope of Allah bi hablillah Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said by habl Allah subhanahu wa taala meant holy quran fa qala al quran hablullah al mateen that is the very strong rope of Allah subhanahu wa taala through which you can go close and near to Allah subhanahu wa taala when you will get hold of that habl you will go through that very habl to Allah subhanahu wa taala and Allah said wala tafarraq and don't make sex and don't make differences and don't make division in the deen of allah subhanahu wa taala wala tanazu fatafshalu 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, then you will lose your power. Then you will lose your strength. Then you will lose your identity even. Then you will lose your dignity which has been given and provided to you based upon the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا وَتَفْشَلُوا وَتَزْحَبَ رِيحُكُمْ Respected brothers and sisters, my submission was that the same deen had been given to Nuh alayhi salatu wa salam because basically and originally deen consists of three basic and original faith and belief. One is called Tawheed or one is of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second one is called Risala or message and prophethood given to various messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the third one is accountability after death which we call Baas Bad al or life after death Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put us to accountability every individual is to be put by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accountability for his good and bad deeds and he would be divided either or he would be punished may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say all of us from his punishment and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a best reward here and in the hereafter so respected brothers and sisters now Islam means to avail peace, to provide peace. Iman means to avail peace, to provide peace. That what we can mean literally by the word Islam and Iman. But Islam is the name of a deen given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can say that Islam is the deen. Islam is the religion given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to all of his messengers. So deen is the same and one. While sharia, these are mukhtalif. Or these are different. As I mentioned, that rules in the lifetime of Hadrat Nuh were different than the rules given to Musa, alayhi salatu wasalam. To some extent, not to a great one, but to some extent. And so was the case of the rules given to Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. I would like to quote only one hadith of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, for example. And in that very hadith, I will mean only one portion of that hadith. And that is, I have been given priority upon all the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by six things. One, I talk in brief, but I meant so much. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will talk in brief. You will find only two words in the sentence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But look at the jurist. Abu Hanifa, Shafi, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Imam Malik, Imam Shabi, Ibn Uyen, Qazi ibn Bilela, Sufyan Suri, Nuh ibn Abi Maryam, Hassan ibn Zihad, Muhammad ibn Hassan, Qazi Abu Yusuf, Waqi ibn al-Jarrah, Ali ibn al-Madini, all these jurists, when you will study thoroughly their books, you will find out what type of talk Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has given. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Utitu, Jawami al-Kalim, I have been given inclusive kalimat. I have been given Jawami al-Kalimat. A kalima which I will speak, it will give you a lot of meanings. Utitu jawami al kalim. The second thing, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Wajuiltu khatam al nabiyyi. I have been made as khatam of anbiya, seal of anbiya, last and final of the anbiya and rusul. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al Ahzab, Makana Muhammad, Aba hadim al rijalikum, Walaki Rasulullah. He is the prophet of Allah. He is the Rasul of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he is the seal of Anbiya. He is the last and final of Anbiya. There will be no any concept of any other prophet or not the prophet of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, respected brothers and sisters, the second priority which has been given our khususiyya, our characteristics given to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that was wajuiltu khatam al nabiyyin. And the third one, which I will mean here in this very hadith, wa uhillat liyal ghanaim. Wa uhillat liyal ghanaim. In the lifetime of all other messengers, the ghanaim or the booty which the Muslim people will gain or avail in the battlefield for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding the property of disbelievers or infidels. So that's called ghanima or booty which the Muslim people they avail and achieve in the battlefield. In the lifetime of all the messengers, their type of mal was not halal and allowed 
for the Muslim of their time that is halal only for the believers in the message of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the followers of Muhammad by this very specific sentence I meant that that was the difference of different messengers regarding their Sharia and that was Shah Waliullah meant by writing that very chapter anna asla deen wahid wa sharaiya mukhtalifa that asli deen that is one and the same and sharaiya and laws these were different in different in the time of different messengers and prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala respected brothers and sisters now Islam is the name of that deen which had been given to various messengers keeping in view the circumstances they have the sphere they have, the atmosphere they have, the environment they have, the culture and the civilization they have. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered them rules and laws keeping in view all these kinds of circumstances. And therefore, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa came, he found the people of Peninsula having certain practices, certain usages, customs, conventions, urf and ada. In Islamic jurisprudence, we call it urf and ada. In English term, we call it conventions, usages. Urf and Ada. So, these customs were categorized by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam into three categories. First of all, those type of customs which were good customs or good usages or good adat and habits, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kept it intact. The second one, which was partially good and partially bad, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reformed it. And the third one, which was totally bad, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam demolished it. And therefore, I would like to say one thing, in Islamic fiqh, or in Islamic jurisprudence, because you cannot understand the holy book of Allah, and the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there you will find so much difference in the practices of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even in the saying of Rasulullah, and also in the practice of the sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now you will go through, go through Islamic jurisprudence, or Islamic usul qanun how we will implement various saying of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How we will follow various sunnahs of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What was the historical background of a specific sunnah? So respected brothers, in Islamic jurisprudence, you will find two kinds of sources of law. One we call fundamental sources of Islamic law. And the second one we call secondary sources of Islamic law. Al-Usul al usul al asasiyah Wal-Usul As-Sanaviyah. As far as the first one is concerned, these are four in number. First of all, the Holy Book of Allah, Kitabullah. The second one, Sunnah Rasul. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and these two we call it original sources these are two original sources the, the, the other sources has been derived from these two original sources the third one is called Ijma Ijma mean consensus of your opinion or unanimous decision given by the well known jurist of Islam because me myself I have no any authority to give a decision I must follow the well known jurist of Islam because they know much more about the book of Allah. They know much more about the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Their knowledge is inclusive. And their knowledge was comprehensive. While I have a little bit. So respected brothers and sisters. My submission was Kitabullah. The second one, Sunnah to Rasul. The third one, Ijma. Or unanimously given decision by the jurist of Ummah. And the fourth one, we call it analogical deduction or analogy or chaos to find out the illa and cause of action in a specific hukum given in Holy Quran or in the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And then you will apply the same cause of action to other resemble type of acts. So that's called chaos while there are six secondary sources. In these six secondary sources of Islamic Sharia, after these four, you will go through these six. One, we call it Asar al-Sahaba. <coughs> the saying of Sahaba, Ridwanullah alayhi majma'i. If you will not find out anything in the holy book of Allah, in the practice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in the ijma which has taken place in the lifetime of Abu Bakr, Umar, Osman and Ali, Ridwanullah alayhi majma'i, then you will go through the saying and practices of Sahaba individually. What Abdullah ibn Abbas said, what Ibn Umar said, what Abu Huraira said, what was the practice of Sayyida Aisha, what was the juristic word given by Sayyida Aisha, radiyallahu ta'ala an, wa ridwanullahi alayhim, alayhim ajma'i. Respected brothers and sisters, so Asar al-Sahaba, the second one, that is Urf, 
and Adah, custom and convention. The third one, that is called istishabul hal. In law or in legal field, we have a specific term for istishabul hal, law of estoppel. Law of estoppel, the thing which has been already decided. Law of estoppel. In law, they call it law of estoppel. That is a well-known jurisprudence, actually and principle here in America as well and all over the world. Istishabul hal. And the fourth one, that is called al-istihsan, al-masalih al-mursala, public welfare. Because Sharia has been given to various messenger for the welfare of general public. Sharia is not there to put you into hardship or into difficulty. La yukallifu Allahu nafsan illa wusaha wa nuyastiruka lil yusra. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to put us in ease, not in difficulty and in hardship. And that's what I will talk about inshallah later on. Date. Sharia has some four objectives. Later on I will talk about. But first of all let me talk about the custom and the convention that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa came he found the people of peninsula practicing various customs and they have various orf and order and habits Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa categorized all these into three categories the good one totally 10% Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa kept it intact the second one partially good and partially bad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa reformed it the third one which was totally bad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa abolished it totally as far as the example for the first one is concerned they used to pay the blood money in shape of camel for one who has been killed unintentionally which is called qatl khata because in sharia there are various kinds of qatl various kinds of killing and murder according to three ayyama shafi malik and ahmad rahimahumullah also the two Senior students of Imam Abu Hanifa, Muhammad ibn Hassan and Qazi Abu Yusuf, they know only three kinds of qatl and three kinds of murder and killing. First of all, qatl Ahmad, intentional murder. The second one, qatl Khata, unintentional murder. And the third one, qatl bi sabab. You did not intend, neither you did it mubasharatan. But you have done something which caused the death of another one. That is called Qatl bi sabab. So these three kinds are known to all these ayamma. But Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, he has put two other kinds. One is called Qatl shib amad Where the intention is, but the Allah is not there. The arm is not there. You have used only a stone. You have used only a stick. And you have hit someone on his head. And ultimately he died. So actually the stick has not been built up by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to kill the human being. But you used it and ultimately the killing was there and the murder was there that is a thing known by Abu Hanifa keeping in view a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala inna qatila khata'il amadi qatilu sawti wal asa ala inna qatila khata'il amadi qatilu sawti wal asa and therefore Rasul Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah he has another concept of another qatl also which is called jari majraya khata or qayamun maqam al khata a substitute of khata that is not actual khata but that is a substitute of khata anyhow my submission was that in the uh, Arabian Peninsula that was a well known practice by the people of Peninsula that whenever there was khatl khata or unintentional murder so they used to pay in shape of blood money 100 camel to the warasa and hairs of the one who has been killed they had called blood money or we call it diya in sharia or we call it in subcontinent khun baha in subcontinent we call it khun baha in sharia we call it a diya or diya to qatl al-khata or in english we call it blood money but they call it in shape of kind of camels so hundred camel were payable to the warasa of the one who was killed by somebody else unintentionally when the surah sallallahu came he asked the people of peninsula what is your practice regarding qatl khata? So they told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that your grandfather Abdul Muttalib who was the chief of Mecca and the surrounding area. First of all he put only 10 camels as blood money for qatl khata. So the people they were careless about qatl khata. They were doing so. They were not so much punctual. And they did not come so much punctual because of 10 camels. Then he increased and put it 20. Then 30. Then 40, when he reached to the digit and figure up 100, so the people, they became punctual. We cannot afford 100 camel. So they were very punctual, for example, in driving. At that time, there was no any driving. I am talking about American society, that you will drive very carefully and punctually. Otherwise, if you will kill someone, then you have to pour 100 camel. 
and if a camel price is for example 10000 dollar then just imagine 10 multiplied by 100 10 multiplied by where from you will bring the money you will use some unfair means in this regard so therefore you must be punctual and care careful in this regard rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said fa izan huwa dini wa bihaza amarani rabbi azza wa jal now that is my deen and that is my sharia and that i have been ordered and commanded by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the custom was good totally and 100% and a protective one therefore rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam kept it intact for example another one which was partially good and partially bad marriage you know marriage in the arabian peninsula the people used to have as many wives as they liked and those who were chief ten with due apology to our palestinian brother so was the case there in subcontinent but we are talking about the deen of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the arabian people they were the first address of the deen of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam therefore would you give examples of arabian peninsula otherwise sisters when rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam came there he found the people having as many wives as they like and without any legal status without any social status without any right as wives when rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam came first of all he decreased the digit and figure and he said fan ke khud ma tawba lakum min an nisa'i masna he did not demolish the marriage custom totally that now when islam has come you cannot marry a woman that was against nature so he did not abolish the practice of marriage but he put certain conditions and limits as far as certain rights of the wives concerned he said fan ke khud ma tawba lakum من النساء مسنا you can marry two وثلاثة three ورباع and four فإن خفتم الله تعدلوا and if you are afraid of injustice you cannot administer justice to all of them because in a hadith narrated by one Tirmidhi رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم said من تزوج امرأتين فلم يعدل بينهما جاء يوم القيامة وشقه مائل أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام a person who has married two wives he can do he can three wives but here in America we do handle only one very difficultly so you must be confined only to one otherwise you will be in trouble there is a musiba of 911 if you will say something one of them they will call 911 and you will be in trouble so you may not put yourself in trouble and you must be punctual and careful in this regard anyhow in sharia that is allowed to have two or three or four but if you are afraid of injustice because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in holy quran that insan has been created by nature a weak one he cannot control himself not to have any wife and he cannot control himself not to do injustice he will do so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says fain khiftum alla ta'dilu fawahida then must be confined you only to one zalika adna alla ta'ulu so you may not commit any kind of sin in this regard otherwise rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said ja yawm al qiyama wa shaqquhu mail otherwise when the person concerned who has not administered justice to both of them or to three or four Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said on the day of judgment on the day of resurrection when he will come out of his grave ja yawm al qiyama wa shaqquhu mail he will be paralyzed 50% 50% he will be paralyzed wa shaqquhu mail he will be in such a position because he has not administered justice to both of the wives so respected but anyhow that is another subject let me take you to the to, to a specific issue which i intended to discuss that is to reform a custom which was partially good and partially bad having a marriage or having a wife that is a natural need that is a natural need because the universal system is totally depend upon marriages that is one thing but now the practices which were taking place there in the arabian peninsula before the message of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that was based totally upon barbarism cruelty and brutality so rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam reformed it and he said la yasihu nika illa bi huzur shahidain aqilain balighin rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said a nikah will not be a legal one a marriage will not be a legal one until you have two shahid two witnesses must be muslim they must be sane people not insane and may not be minors one thing then rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said there must be a khitbah 
a khitbah that is a sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That was the well-known practice of the Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, if two person, a male and female, they will arrange their marriage upon their own. That will be legal, but that will be durable or payadar or not. So just imagine the life here in America. What's going on regarding love marriages? Once I was asked there in a school that you the Muslim people you do arrange marriages and we the American people we do love marriages. So he said that arranged marriages are successful. So I countered the question and I means in uh, ask the person concerned or the student concerned that son tell me about the divorce rate here in America and divorce rate there in Pakistan or Muslim countries. There, most of the marriages are arranged, and here most of the marriages are based upon love. What is the divorce rate here, and what is the divorce rate there in Pakistan? There, and especially in my area, me, Hafiz sir, Qari sir, and our two Lala's big brothers, we are from the Pashtun area. In Pashtun area, you cannot imagine to divorce your wife, because that is against the tradition of the, the, the Pashtun people. Why you are divorcing your wife? You are going to humiliate her. You have no any right to humiliate a woman. So I told him that arranged marriages are successful and durable because of our tradition which we have practiced since the days of our great grandfather. And as far as your love marriages is concerned, today you involved in a law and you married a woman. And after one year or two years, what happened to that very woman? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raja'oon. Rasulullah sallallahu said, Abghadul mubahati illallahi at-talaq. Abghadul, that is a legal practice. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, at the same moment, that is a very dislike the practice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are going to divorce a wife. You are going to divorce a woman to humiliate her and to put her there down. What the people will think about that very woman? What she has done? Why you have divorced her? What was wrong with her? So respected brothers and sisters, my submission was that Rasulullah reform, reformed that very practice. As far as the practice of idealism is concerned, our shirk was concerned, that was also their custom. Rasulullah is this practice was totally wrong and totally bad shirk. Shirk has no any legal authority, means it has no any good concept. Shirk is bad totally. Maybe shirk fil aqeelah or shirk fil amal or shirk fil tasarruf or shirk fil ilam or shirk fil hakuma or shirk fil nizam because shirk has certain kinds if a person believe in more than one god or three in one or one in three as the people do here three in one or one in three i don't know the philosophy beyond three in one and one in three inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun either god, god is divided into three categories or god is combination of three entities Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun Qul Huwa Allahu ahad Allahu samad Lam yalid wa lam yulad Wa lam yakul lahu kufuan ahad There is no any concept of trinity No any concept of blood relation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala With anybody from amongst his creation From amongst his makhluq From amongst the khalq Respected brothers and sisters Now My submission was that shirk was totally wrong, Rasulullah demolished and abolished the concept of shirk totally. So, I meant that there are some secondary sources for Islamic Sharia. Now we must follow the fundamental sources, then we will go to the secondary sources. That's what Rasulullah asked Hazrat Mu'az ibn Jabal when he was sending him to Yemen as wali of Yemen. Hazrat Mu'az ibn Jabal was asked by Rasulullah Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Ma'ad taqzi ya ma'az Bimada taqzi ya ma'az Oh ma'az What will be the basic source of your decision And verdict You will give as a wali and governor He said Bi kitab illa I will decide the issues and matter Based upon the holy book of Allah Subhanahu wa Qala fa illam tajid If you will not find this issue concerned There in the book of Allah What you will do then He said Fa bi sunnati Rasulillah then on the sunnah of Rasulullah فَإِلَّمْ تَجِدْ If you will not find out that very thing in the sunnah and practice of Rasulullah وسلم, what you will do then? قَالَ إِذَنْ أَجُتَّهِدُ بِرَائِي Then based upon holy Quran and sunnah I will apply my own mind but to apply your own mind that is only the practice of a alim of Quran and sunnah a common man he cannot apply his mind regarding the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala otherwise he is going to open a Pandora box he will be in trouble but the whole community will be in trouble 
But Mu'az ibn Jabal, he was a well-known scholar of Quran and Sunnah. So he said, Izan ajtahidu birai. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made a dua. Alhamdulillahi alladhi wafaqa rasoola rasoolihi lima yuhibbuhu wa yardahu. Praise be for Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala who has given tawfiq to the messenger of his own messenger. Mu'az ibn Jabal, he was the messenger of the messenger of Allah. Alhamdulillahi alladhi wafaqa rasoola rasoolihi. Messenger of his own messenger lima yuhibbuhu wa yardahu. Towards a thing which is liked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is your decision and practice must be based upon Holy Quran. Then upon the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the decision given by the intellectual of Quran and sunnah. The Mujtahideen and the Jurist and the Ulama is Mu'az ibn Jabal himself was. So respected brothers and sisters, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given that very deed to every messenger. And Sharia Mukhtalif are different Sharia rules and laws to various messengers in their lifetime. That was a continuous and consistent practice given to the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the deen was in process. Why the rules in the lifetime of Nuh were different than the lifetime of Hadrat Ibrahim because in the lifetime Hadrat Nuh alayhi salatu was salam the people of that time was not so much civilized as the people of Hadrat Ibrahim then the people of Musa were so much civilized than the people at the time of Hadrat Ibrahim and when the, 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 the issue reached or the process reached to the lifetime of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala perfected and he completed that very deal in the lifetime of Muhammad. So that is something logical. There is something reasonable. The deen was in process. And that was completed in the lifetime of Rasulullah. Why we say that those who believe in the message of Musa and they do not believe in the message of Isa, they are disbelievers and they are not Muslim. We do say so. We, we must say so. Those who believe in the message of Isa and they do not believe in the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa They are believers or disbelievers? They are disbelievers. And that much I was asked by someone, he was a non-Muslim, he was a Christian. So, my Christian brother, he asked me that why it is so? You the Muslim people, you do marry Christian and Jew women. That is allowed in your Sharia. Why a Jew and Christian man, he cannot marry a Muslim woman? Why he cannot marry a Muslim woman? So I said to him, because we the Muslim people believe in the message of Musa, the messenger of Jew, and the message, message of Isa, the messenger of Christian, and the Jew and Christian, they do not believe in the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, therefore we do not allow them to marry a Muslim woman. He said, oh, that's the issue. I said, yes, that's the point. That's the point. Why we do marry a Christian woman? Because we do believe in the message of their messenger, and he was Isa. Why we do marry a Jew woman? Because we believe in the message of Musa. But why they cannot do so? Because they do not believe in the message of Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if they will believe in the message of Muhammad, then there will be no any hurdle in this regard. We will marry them our sisters. We will marry them our daughters. We will marry them our means sisters and daughters. Why? Because by accepting the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he will be one of us. He will be one of the Muslim community. He will be one of our Muslim brother. So respected brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in the deen, indallahi al-islam, that deen in the sight of Allah, in the eyes of Allah is only Islam. And Islam is the same deen which was given to Adam, to Noah, to Ibrahim, to Musa, to Isa, and completed in the lifetime of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as Allah said, al-yawma, akmaltu lakum deenakum, wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati, وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ الدِّينَ رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم was there in Arafat or in Arafat and Jibreel Amin came at the moment and he brought the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but a happy news and glad tidings that al-yawma today أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ I have completed for your benefit because lam in لغت عربية that is lil intifa al-yawma akmaltu lakum that is for your benefit that is regarding your advantages if you will follow the deen you will get the benefit here and in the hereafter if a person will deny the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he will suffer he, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said law jama'an nasu ala atqa qalbi rajul ma zada zalika fi mulki allahi shia if the entire humanity 
and all the human beings they will believe in the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Muhammad himself believed in they become Muslim like the Islam of Muhammad for example Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said it cannot increase anything in the kingship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you are not giving any kind of advantage and benefit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but you are availing yourself وَلَوْ جَمَعَ النَّاسِ عَلَىٰ أَفْسَقِ قَلْبِ رَجُلْ مَا نَقَصَ ذَلِكَ فِي مُلْكِ اللَّهِ شَيْءَ And if the people may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say all of us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide the whole humanity to the right path say Ameen and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give Iman to all these humans who are running here and there just like animals may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make them perfect and Human, uh, perfect human being and true human being to accept the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi because that is our duty if you will not convey the message we will be accountable we will be on the day of resurrection Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask us as I will later on inshallah I will discuss in detail that Islam has four original branches how many? four first of all beliefs the second one morality or character the third one practices practices in every aspect of your life and the fourth one responsibilities regarding responsibilities we have two responsibilities as a Muslim we have two responsibilities one is called a dawah and the second one is called al jihad but when you know the Muslim people pronounce the word jihad so the people become afraid of oh terrorism terrorist inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun oh so inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun Islam is peace that is not there but to protect your own life to protect your property to protect again and again if you will fight for the protection of your life you have all the right to do because the people are doing even the non-muslim they are doing so they are protecting their life they are protecting their property they are protecting their dignity and respect as they have i don't know what type of respect and dignity is there but they are protecting their dignity and respect if you will touch someone without her free consent I will not say his, his. If without her free consent, if you will touch her, what will happen to you? Yes, subhanallah, you will remain in prison for how many years? I don't know. That's your life, don't know here in America. If you will touch a woman, though she is naked, more than half naked, but if you will touch her without her free consent, if she is consented, that everything is okay. So, dignity and respect is protected every year in any line, every law. And so is the case of intellect in mind. Why? The American people or the Western world, they say, they, for example, Pakistan. In some areas of Pakistan, maybe I don't know, there will be cultivation of poppy. You know poppy? We are from the derived the, the, the powder, the heroin. So the American people, they order the Pakistani government that sees cultivation of poppy. Why? Because it will go to make the people insane and crazy they will lose their intellect they will lose their mind and therefore in sharia in islamic sharia use of intoxicant is haram rasulullah sallallahu said kullu muskirin haram that everything which can make you insane that is haram and that was hadrat umar radiallahu ta'ala said that i never taken wine even before islam before islam so someone asked him, before Islam there was no any Zabita and rule. There was no any prohibition. After Islam, the taking of wine was allowed up the fourth year after Hijra even. Because Hamar, that was prohibited in the fourth year after immigration to Medina. إِنَّمَا الْخَمْرُ وَالْمَيْسِرُ وَالْأَنْسَابُ وَالْأَزْلَامُ رِشْتُمْ مِنْ عَمَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ Hazrat Umar said, no. When a type of drink or a type of means eating will make you insane and will convert you to become a donkey why you are taking the same thing you should not take it because you will lose your intellect and your mind and you will become not only an animal but more worse than animal so in sharia all kinds of intoxicant are here they say if you are drunk you cannot drive otherwise you will get ticket you will get ticket and sometimes you will lose your license even if you will get red-handed, you will be gotten red-handed two or three times, you will lose your driving license even. But in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ordered us not to use intoxicant. Don't become drunk. Don't become. It means that Islam is a perfect rule and a perfect law. And that is a perfect religion, a perfect system. 
So, respected brother and sister, my submission was that four things are well known, recognized, precious and valuable things to protect your life, to protect your property, to protect your honor and respect, and to protect your intellect and mind. But the issue is their protection of belief. Protection of belief. To Muslim, belief and aqeedah our deen and religion is much more precious than any other precious and valuable thing. And therefore, they do fight for the safety and security of their faith and belief. That is the only one thing that is our duty to make them understand that our belief is, that belief is much more precious than every precious and valuable thing. And then they will find out that why they fight for the sake of Allah in the name of the, in the path of Allah subhanahu, then they will not say that these people are terrorists. Or they are dashat girl, or sometime like that. So, my submission was that we have two responsibilities. One is called Dawa. What? Dawa. And the second one is called Jihad. What we can mean by Dawa? Dawa has two branches. One, Dawa are called to the Muslim, non-Muslim people. We must convince, convince in a sense that the system given to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam that is a perfect one. The religion given to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam that is a completed one. So you must follow that. We will convince them we cannot use force. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, La ikraha fi deen. You have no any right to, to force someone to accept your deen. No, you should convince them in a very lenient and kind way. As the practice of Muhammad was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَزَّنْ غَلِيزَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَزُّوا مِنْ حَلِكْ With by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, O Muhammad, you have become so much lenient for these people. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ And that what Baraya ibn Azim meant, as narrated by Imam Tirmizi in Shamayla Tirmizi, that Rasulullah sallallahu that whenever a newcomer came and he had the first glance of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and first look of, of his face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he was afraid of how I will talk to this type of personality. وَلَكِنْ إِذَا تَكَلَّمَهُ أَحَبَّهُ إِذَا رَآهُ هَابَّهُ وَإِذَا تَكَلَّمَهُ أَحَبَّهُ But when he tried to talk to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he found Muhammad the much more kind personality all over the world. That he is the one who is the much more lenient personality. And therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and my brother will tell me out that the word Allah, that is for tasallut, to become dominant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you have controlled high character. Exalted character have been controlled by O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That has become your nature. That is your second nature, wa inna kala ala khuluqin azim. So respected brothers and sisters, my submission was that da'wah to convince the non-Muslim in a lenient way, in a kind way. That is one. And the second branch is da'wah to Muslim people. We have a lot of Muslims here. They claim to be Muslim. They say la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. They know they do not offer their prayer five times a day. They don't have any touch with the masjid. They don't have any touch with the religious uh, 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 rituals and religious practices. So we must convince them in a proper way that as a Muslim, you are bound to perform your duty. Otherwise, you would be asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will be not satisfied or unsatisfied here in this world and you will be in trouble in the hereafter. So just to convince him in a very lenient way to perform his duty as a Muslim. That is the second branch of Dawah. And as far as Jihad is concerned, Jihad doesn't mean only to fight and to take sword and to kill. No. Just look into the life of Rasulullah sallallahu Even whenever he found out that some people are making conspiracies against Islam and Muslim. But when he reached there to the battlefield, first of all, he presented to them to accept Islam. Later on, he presented to them to accept jizya. Means to believe to believe in our dominance, that we will be dominant and you will be subject to the dominance of the Muslim people. From the very beginning, he did not start to kill the people. And then he delivered a speech. لا تقتلوا سبيانهم Don't kill their kids. ولا شيوخهم Their aged people. ولا تهتكوا أستارا نسائهم And don't humiliate their women. ولا تمثلوا قتلاهم 
and don't amputate and cut the organs of their dead bodies. Wala taqtulu mawashihim and don't kill their cattle. Wala tuharriku zuru'ahum and don't burn their grain and their meat, their cattle body and their crops. That what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam delivered whenever he read to a battlefield. So the people they are telling us that we are peaceful people and you are terrorists. No, peace has been taught to the humanity by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aman and Salam both were taught by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, respected brothers and sisters, my submission was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the deen, in the Allah islam that deen in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only Islam. وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِ غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينَ فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ And a person who will see something else than Islam as a deen, as a system, as an Islam فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْ هُوَ Their type of Islam and system will never be accepted from him. وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ And in the hereafter, he will be one of the losers. So if you want to be successful here and in the hereafter, you must be committed to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and word spirit, and you must do practice of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every aspect of your life. Later on, inshallah, when next month Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us tawfiq and I will come here. So later on, inshallah, we will proceed further. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا عَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِ Meet me just like an examination paper. Consists of four questions. If inshallah I will pass this this uh, examination paper, then I would be given a seat here in America, because that is a complete examination. So the first question is, how can a Muslim invest his money in this country? That is not a matter of this country and that country. Islam everywhere and anywhere is one and the same, and the Muslim are bound. To follow the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may be there in a Muslim country or a non-Muslim country. Anywhere they must follow the commandments of Allah and the practices of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A thing which is haram there in Pakistan will be haram here. A thing which was haram there in Medina, that is haram here. What is the name of this city? San Jibril. That is haram here in San Jibril. Because that hurma has been brought by Jibril, I mean to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and you people are living here in San Jibril, so you must be committed to the message given by Jibril. <laughs> so, respected brothers, anything which is haram and forbidden in Sharia, that is forbidden every year and any year. And we will find out a halal way keeping in view our own circumstances. So, for example, in this regard, I would like to say, how you will invest your money in this country first of all i will say three things here the people they take a plea that we are in the rura under the doctrine of necessity we can do this and can do that and can that is to open a pandora box not to have any kind of haram and prohibited thing there is nothing forbidden then if you will define the necessity in such a way that we are in necessity under the doctrine of necessity this is halal and this is allowed that is allowed and that is, then nothing is prohibited in sharia what we can mean by the rura, Allama Shatibi, he has written a book in four volumes known by the name of Al Muwafaqat. The second volume of that very book, the heading of that very volume is Maqasid Sharia, the objectives of Sharia. So, in that very chapter, he is mentioned that there are three things in the life of every individual one is called necessity, the second one is called facility, and the third one is called luxuries. Now, a haram thing would never be allowed for luxurious life. To have a BMW, or to have a Mercedes 2000, or to have a Toyota Lexus, because there's a luxury. To have a Honda car of $1,000, that is your necessity here. Because it can take you easily to your job, which is, for example, 10, 12 miles. So, a Honda of $1,000 can take you there very easily. So, you are in no any need of Toyota Lexus or in BMW to have a riba business in this regard or to pay riba and interest in this regard because car is my necessity. What type of necessity you are talking about? Your necessity is Honda or Toyota of $1,000 of $2,000. So, First of all, we should define necessity. Necessity is a thing 
without which a person cannot live. For example, you are food. You are in need of food, but you are in no need of chicken. Your food may be a solid only. That is your need. So if you are dying of hunger, so you can take a haram thing to put a little bit in your stomach to keep alive. That is necessity. After that, all other things will be either facilities or luxuries. So Sharia will never allow any prohibited thing in case of luxury or in case of facility. That is one thing. Now, how you will invest? If you have money, it means that you have no any necessity. You are talking about facility or luxury because you are going to invest. So going to invest that is facility. So you must be committed to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Sharia. There is a concept of partnership. There is a concept of murabaha. There is a concept of salam. In Sharia, we can find certain things. One is called shirkati mudaraba. You can give your money, for example, to this brother. That you have your own investment. Just put my money in your business and give me my share based upon the ratio of the money or the capital I have. That's called shirkati, or that's called shirkati sadish, or simple shirka, sim simple partnership. If someone, he knows something regarding business, but he has no any money, and you have hundred thousand dollars, just give it to their brother, they invest that money, you will be my sharik as a sharik muzare. Labor will be from your side and money from my side. Fifty percent profit you will take and fifty percent I will take. That's called shirkati mudaraba. There is another thing, shirkati murabaha. So in Murabaha, you can purchase a thing, for example, this paper for $100. You can give it to that brother by sale, telling him that I have purchased it with $100 or by $100, you will pay me $110. So when you will tell him the actual price of a specific thing and asking him a specific portion of profit or nafa in this regard by way of sale,